come this morning thanking you and praising you for your presence. Thank you for our earlier Bible study that we had this morning, Father. I just thank you. I pray that you would use me in the next few minutes, Father, that I would be able to bring your message, bring your word, in the truth that it was offered, giving you, Father, the honor and the glory for everything's accomplished. And I pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Olivet Discourse. Uh, this is, uh, may seem like a strange message for this time of year, the season that we're in, but it's quite in place and you'll see that as we go through this. I've given you the notes to this. I wanted, you, wanted it to go along with the notes that I gave you last week uh, because they go together. If you look at the Jewish calendar, you'll notice that today, uh, well, actually yesterday at dusk, uh, it started, and today at dusk it will end, uh, the Day of Atonement, uh, the middle feast day of the fall feast that we talked about last week. Yom Kippur. Um, today is the 10th day of the month of Tishariah on the Jewish calendar. And last week we looked at the fall feast and we talked about the importance of those feast days. And I wanted to bring this message today, this teaching, as we start looking at the millennial reign of Christ, as we start facing that the end of the fall feast days, I told you last week, as we look at this season, it's important to look at this as a season. The reason is, we don't know about the calendar. We don't know how accurate the calendars are as we look at these dates, when we look at the calendar, especially the, the, the Roman calendar, the calendar that we go by uh, every day. Uh, so we don't really know, but understand that the season that we're in, and this season being the fall season, the the fall harvest season on the Jewish calendar and the importance of these three feast days that fall into this season. Uh, when I was praying over this message, God gave me this and the Holy Spirit led me to Matthew and I started reading in chapter 24 uh, and thinking about the millennial reign of Christ because that's what we're heading into. Uh, as we look at these fall feast days, uh, I thought it was important that we cover the questions that the disciples had asked Jesus as he sat on the Mount of Olives and he brought the disciples around him and they, were, they had asked these questions and he began to answer the questions that they had asked. And the questions that they had asked are three simple questions and we were going to look at those today. They asked him, when will these things be that he had been talking about? The second question that they asked was, what will uh, the signs of his coming be? So that they would know. And what will be the signs of the end times? They asked those three questions of Jesus as he was teaching them. Now understand that this is very shortly Jesus is going to be crucified. This is not long before the crucifixion. So he's gathered the disciples together with him on, on the Mount of Olives, and he is explaining to them what's going to take place in the end times and when he returns as Christ. Now, understand also that the disciples at this time are not saved. They are simply learning, and Jesus is teaching them everything he can possibly teach them in this period of time before the crucifixion, before the resurrection, and before all of that takes place. So as we look at this, I think to understand what Jesus was teaching these guys in this time as he answers these three questions, we need to look at the entire chapter of Matthew chapter 24 because that entire chapter actually offers that answers to these questions as uh, Jesus begins to talk about them. So I wanted to look at that. I wanted to look at chapter 24, and we're going to look at a couple of other things as we go through this because it leads us into other things. So in Matthew chapter 24, starting in verse 1, and Jesus went out 
and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him uh, the building of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the signs of thy coming of the end of the world? So they ask all three questions in that verse. It's what you see. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. I find it interesting that Jesus begins to answer these questions with a warning. He starts to tell them, Don't let anybody deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, and see that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. The first thing that Jesus wanted his disciples to know as he began this explanation or answering of these three questions was that there would be many false religions. And they would be religious teachers who were false, who were not true. And they would lead people astray. In fact, we see that today as we look around in our world today. His message about false religious teachers and misleading everyone, even the very elect, the very elect is the church. I want you to understand that what Jesus was talking about here was very real in his day and all through the New Testament period, and it's still true today. Always remember that these disciples, as they write their accounts of these events that are taking place, especially with Jesus, they're all writing their interpretation or their take on the account. They're all sitting there listening to the same thing, but they're all writing in their own thinking. They're all writing what they took away from the encounter with Jesus. So they're writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God is in the inspiration, but they're writing what they, what they heard, what they saw, what they experienced. It's kind of like if you put three people in a room and one person tells a story, all three people will interpret the story differently. It's just, it just depends on a lot of different things. And personally, everyone interprets things the way that they, they see them. So when we look at this and we start to think about this, I realize that in Luke chapter 21, there were uh, verses that really are better off if you insert them in between verses 6 and 7 of Matthew 24 because Luke gives a better account of this particular episode, this particular uh, situation here. So we're going to look at those right quick. In Luke chapter 21, verses 20 through 24. And when you shall see Jerusalem encompassed with armies, then, you, uh, then know that the de desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in uh, Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter in thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon the people." And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The times of the Gentiles has not been fulfilled yet. But we're entering into the, the end of the time of the Gentiles. I want you to understand that. The question then of when is answered. When you see these things happening, it's what Jesus has told them. When you see Jerusalem encompassed by armies, when you see all these things that are taking place in, in the verses that Luke gives us and the verses that Matthew gives us, when you see the wars, when you hear the rumors of wars, when you see all that taking place. Jerusalem encompassed by armies. If you just pay attention to what's going on politically in our world today, 
the whole world is taking up offense against Jerusalem right now. So when we start talking about the end times and the second coming of Christ, I want you to understand, I want you to read this, I want you to know what Jesus was saying here, and then I want you to look and see where we are today. We are in a place where Israel is singled out as being the problem. And the whole world is starting to come against, even this country is starting to come against Israel. So pay attention. When the armies have encompassed Jerusalem or Israel, pay attention. The second question, what will be the sign of your coming? is addressed in Matthew 24 again. We're going to start in verse 7. For a nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. The disciples had asked Jesus what the signs of the end times would be when they asked what will be the signs of your coming. The first sign Jesus points to is war. Not just any war, but a war that would include the entire world. Now I've included in your notes that I gave you that there have been over 15,000 wars in the world since the world began or since history started to record wars. But a special war started by two nations and joined by many other nations on either side until the entire world was involved in it occurred in 1914. It lasted from 1914 until 1918. It was called World War I. And when you look at that, you understand that the prophecy that Jesus spoke to the disciples was fulfilled in World War I. I want you to understand also, we, we look at time by years, God doesn't look at time by years. God looks at time in his time. And when we try to bring everything forward and, and pack everything together in time, it, it doesn't work. It confuses us sometimes. Just look at what is actually taking place. Look at what has taken place over the life of this country, over the life of several other countries around. But the entire world was involved in World War I. It was supposed to be the war to end all wars. Of course it wasn't. There have been other wars since then, World War II, and then this country has been involved in many other wars around the, the world. So as stated in Matthew 24, 8, all these are the beginnings of sorrow, the beginning of birth pains. Israel is the key here. Isaiah 66, verses 7 and 8 tell us this. Before she travailed, she brought forth, before her pain came. She was delivered of a man-child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such a thing? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children talking about Israel. It's talking about the birth of Christ. It's talking about all the things that Jesus was talk, telling his disciples about. Beginning in Matthew 24, verse 9, Jesus gives a description of the tribulation period. And that's what Isaiah is starting to explain here, the tribulation period, which is described in more detail in Revelation 4, chapters 4 through chapters 9. The tribulation will cover... Seven years, three and a half to be not so bad, but tribulation. The last three and a half is usually referenced as the great tribulation. So if it's referenced as the great tribulation, it is a terrible time for mankind. When we go back to Matthew chapter 24 and we start in verse 9, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. He's talking to the Jews. I want you to understand that the tribulation period, the period of time that we're in right now, the season that we're in, the season of atonement, the feast of atonement has all to do with the Jews. 
It has to do with the salvation of the Jews. It has to do with saving Israel. It has to do with saving Jerusalem. It has to do with saving the Jews. So don't be confused. The church is gone. The church has been raptured. We're not here. The age of the Gentiles has ended. The age we've turned our attention back to the salvation of Israel when we start in, in this, in the tribulation period. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 10, And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness uh, unto all nations, and then shall the end come. It's interesting if you go to the book of Revelation and you read about the tribulation time, you'll see the preaching of this gospel. We talk about the two witnesses, the 144,000. All that is the gospel being preached to all the nations after the church is gone. Right now, the job of the church is to preach to all the nations. But when the church is gone, God will turn his attention to Israel. He'll turn his attention to the Jews. And he will put his witnesses here to go out and evangelize all the nations, all the Jews. In Matthew 24, verse 15, And when you therefore uh, shall see the abomination and desolation spoke of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso hath readeth, let him understand. So if you want to fully understand this, read the Revelation and read the book of Daniel because both of those go hand in hand with this time period of the, of the uh, uh, tribulation time. Verse 16 says, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let them which is uh, on the housetop and not come down to take anything out of, it, out of his house. Neither let uh, him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your uh, flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall the great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor... Uh, no, not, nor ever shall be. And except these days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So we're given a promise, even in the tribulation, that those days of tribulation will be shortened. Jesus is the prophet here. He is prophesying about the tribulation period. If any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. Because Christ hadn't returned to the earth yet. That's what he's saying. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect. The Antichrist. The false prophet. That's what he's referring to. And the world will believe them. And the world will follow them during the tribulation. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if thou shalt say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. They will know when Christ comes. They will know. Jesus gives a brief but a complete picture of the tribulation period. The detailed descriptions of uh, was given by John in the tribulation, and you can go to the book of Revelation and read that. I encourage you to do that because the tribulation period is something that we will not experience as far as the church is concerned. We will be gone. But those who are left on the earth will experience the tribulation period. Those who are saved during the tribulation period will be martyred for their salvation, for their confession of faith. So just know that. Back to... Matthew chapter 24, verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So now he's talking about the, the second coming of Christ. For wheresoever 
the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation in those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, as they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So Jesus gives a very detailed description of the second coming of Christ. He, he references that as the Son of Man. He's talking to his disciples. Remember, he's already told the disciples many, many times, he's the Son of Man, Jesus. And he's talking about the Christ. He's talking about, he's trying to tell his disciples who he is and what's about to happen. He's trying to get them to understand that the resurrected Christ comes from his crucifixion that's about to take place in, his, in the life of Jesus. So he's laying all of this out to the disciples so when these things happen, they know where they are and what's taking place. In the end of the tribulation, the earth will see the return of Christ. And we are told that he, when his feet touch the ground, touch the earth, the earth will split. We're told that he will come as judge. He will come as king. He will come with a sword. And he will come with an army. He's not coming as a lamb. He's not coming in love. He's coming to judge the evil that's on the earth because the church, the love, has already been taken off the earth. So just know that he comes as totally different when he comes the second time. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 through 18, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, a lot of people will tell you that the church has got to go through the tribulation because it says so. That's not true. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that the earth will be called, the church will be called off the earth. Where does it say the church will meet the Lord? In the air. We know we're not here on the earth when Christ returns. When Christ returns, he returns as judge. The church has already been judged. It was judged in Jesus Christ. We will, we will be removed from the earth. The judgment seat of Christ that the church goes through are the rewards or the crowns that will be given to, the, to the, those who make up the church for the things we did in Christ. So just know that. Don't fall for the, the, the narrative that's out here that the church must go through the tribulation. Why would you send your child through such a, such a time as Jesus has just explained to his disciples, and we are the children of God. Back in Matthew chapter 24, verse 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, uh, from one end of heaven to the other, and the angels of heaven, uh, but my father, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. So Matthew restates or states what uh, Paul restated in First uh, Thessalonians. So we've seen the answers Jesus gave his disciples to the three questions. I hope you see that the fall feast days are the fulfillment of the fall feast days are the answers to the questions that, that he gave his disciples. The second coming of Christ, these false fall feast days are integral parts of of the second coming of Christ. And the second coming of Christ is the integral part of the fall feast days. Jesus ends his discourse with a warning on the Mount of Olives. Back in Matthew chapter 24, I want you to listen to the warnings that Jesus gives his disciples. But as the days of Noah were, so shall all also the coming of the Son of Man be. What were the days of Noah like? The days of Noah was evil. The whole world was evil. God could only find one person 
who was worthy, and that was Noah. So I want you to understand that when he says, but, the, uh, but as the days of Noah, he's talking about the world will be, once again, an evil, evil place. Look at verse 38. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not when the hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what, in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be uh, broken up. Therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. We talk about all the time here, you don't know the hour, you don't know the watch, you don't know the time, but you don't, do know the season. Uh, in verse uh, 45, Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is the servant whom, the Lord, uh, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find him so doing. Verily I say unto you that he <clears throat> shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, where uh, my Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servant, and to eat and drink with uh, the drunken, the Lord of the servant shall come in the day when the, he took it not uh, for him, and in an hour that uh, he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I hope you see in reviewing quickly the 24th chapter of Matthew. As Jesus answers these three questions that his disciples had asked, I hope you see the importance of the fall feast days and understanding those with the answering of those three questions. These fall feast days will be fulfilled with the return of Christ. The return of Christ, Jesus just laid out in his dissertation as he was teaching his disciples. He told them everything that we talk about about the fall feast days. So Jesus, the prophet, is sitting there with his disciples prophesying of the end time, prophesying of the second coming of Christ, prophesying of all the things the fall feast days represent the rapture of the church, the, the uh, salvation of Israel, the second coming of Christ, and the tribulation. And then finally, we go into the time when God will actually take up residence as Christ with mankind on the earth in the days of tabernacle, the feast of tabernacle. So I hope you take these, put them with the other notes we had last week because those times, and next week we're gonna look in a little more detail in the Feast of Tabernacles, and we'll talk about that a little more, and I'll have some more notes to go with uh, everything that you have on the Fall Feast. So just understand that the importance of knowing what Jesus was teaching his disciples so long ago. Jesus was teaching it as it would happen the next day. But remember, it's on God's timeline. And people say, well, they've been talking about that for thousands of years. It's not going to happen because if it was going to happen, it would have already happened. God doesn't care about our time. It has nothing to do with God. God's not ready. It hasn't happened yet. I'm not saying it won't happen because we're still in that season. That's what you have to understand. We're still in the season. And when you look at the season, the Feast of Trumpets, seven days later is the Feast of the, the salvation of the Jews, the, everything that God turns his attention to, that's seven days on the calendar. Seven years of tribulation that Israel has to go through for that salvation. Ten days from the days it starts, we go into 
the time when Christ will actually come to earth and live with man, will tabernacle with man. Ten days represents the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. So just, just know there's hints and there's keys through all of this that it all is related one to the other. So pay attention. Be aware. Know, and that's what Jesus is telling these guys. Be aware. Don't, don't fall asleep. Don't, don't go numb. Because there's a lot of things that are going on in the world. Don't let the world take your attention. Earlier this morning, we were talking about how Satan deceives us and steals our time and steals our, our joy away from us as we face the difficulties of life. Don't let that take your attention off of what's going on around us. Be spiritually aware. And that's important that we do, that we're spiritually aware. Could we all stand, please? If you're here this morning and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is a great time to come forward and receive what God is offering you this morning through Jesus Christ. That is salvation. Salvation that is complete, salvation that's whole, and salvation that's true. Salvation will keep us with the family of God, and we will be raptured out of this place before all the tribulation starts. And that's, that's important to know because I don't want to see anyone have to go through the tribulation. I don't want anyone to have to go through all the sorrows of this world as they go through it. The earth will still remain, but it will be cleansed by fire. And when the earth is cleansed by fire, those people who are still left on the earth will beg to be killed, will beg to die, and there will be no death found for them. So it's going to, not going to be a pleasant place. It's not going to be a pretty place. But the places where the church will be raptured will be with Christ. We will be there. We will be in the place that God has prepared for us. So just understand there's alternatives to what's going on in the world today, and that alternative is Jesus Christ. So if you're here this morning, you don't have Jesus Christ or you need to renew your relationship with Jesus Christ, all you have to do is just repent and do it. That's all that, all that happens. And, and God will receive you and God will, will hug you and bless you this morning. Uh, he loves you. And there's no malice at all in God towards anyone. Thank you, Miss Joy. Y'all have a wonderful week. Come back and be with us on Wednesday night as we're studying in the book of Genesis. We're headed towards the end of Genesis. We're not going to be far from the end of it. Uh, we're going to start talking about Joseph Wednesday night, and then we'll move to Joseph and Benjamin, and then we'll uh, be moving into the latter chapters of Genesis as we move into that. Y'all have a wonderful week. Um, I ask Brother Thomas again to close us in prayer, uh, and y'all... Y'all just be blessed and have a wonderful week. Brother Thomas.